when certain surahs are quoted, especially surah 9, is quoted to somebody, a lot of times the Muslim will say, those verses might sound violent, but you have to understand the historical context. We were being persecuted and killed and our life was in danger. You sometimes hear variations of that, or you will even hear about the beginning of Muhammad's ministry, uh, as they refer to it, with the severe persecution. And so this relates to how, how, we, how we actually understand Islamic history and in, even interpret certain passages of the Quran. And so it actually has modern day implications. That's my understanding. Why do you think this topic is important? This question of were the early Muslims persecuted in your mind? Why is it important? Well, this is this is tapping into a much larger issue, right? Uh, which is how much can we really know about the early origins of Islam? Okay. Um, if uh, if the early Muslims were persecuted uh, the way Muslims often say they were, um, then you have um, good reason to think Islam was born in the context of peaceful monotheism. Um, so I, I can see why this issue is important to a lot of people, um, but but there's so much that goes into it, and it's it's much more complicated to answer than than we'd want. But we can uh, we can definitely delve in. All right. Well, then let's begin by answering the question to Beal: Were the early Muslims persecuted? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Um, <laughs> it's uh, <clears throat> the first thing we have to take a look at is our sources. Okay, how do we know anything about the origins of Islam? Um, was there somebody there who was writing it? And the answer is no, there wasn't. Uh, again, Arabic, uh, as I said in, in the previous show, Arabic wasn't in a literary form by the time of Muhammad's life. So no one was writing at the time of Muhammad uh, what was going on. So how do we know what happened? Well, the primary account that we have now, I want to emphasize this. The primary account that we have that gives us the contours of Muhammad's life, that tells us when he was born, when he died, what events happened, in what sequence, the main account that we get that from is, a, is a, uh, an account called Ibn Ishaq's Sirat Rasulullah. This was written about 140 years after Muhammad died. How long? 140 years. So that would place it at uh, 60, 630, uh, it's, it's 7, about 70, 70? 70, okay. Um, now, here's the problem, though. We don't actually have that book. What we have is what somebody saved out of that book. So there was a man named Ibn Hisham who saved portions of the book. Now, when we ask why didn't he save all of them, we don't have to guess. He tells us. Ibn Hisham tells us that there were portions of Ibn Ishaq's book that either A, he felt unreliable, B, his teacher said was unreliable, or C, was just impossible and, and uh, unconscionable, like things that he couldn't possibly believe were true. Um, and so he left those sections out. All that he kept is what we have today. Okay. All right. So, 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 this, so would this be yeah, roughly, here. Would this be um, roughly equivalent to our first gospel being written, you know, like 180 AD or something like that? You know, like the first guy, because if the gospel is like kind of, kind of like a biography of Jesus's life, because the Quran is certainly not that. Is that roughly equivalent? Um, yes, it is roughly equivalent to that, except if somebody wrote it and then said and then somebody else came along and said, well, I didn't really believe lots oh, of that. Yeah. So here's my edit of it. Right. So, yeah. Um, so that's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and the second guy that saved the portions, how far away is he from Muhammad's death? Uh, he was just a couple generations behind Ibn Ishaq. So uh, we're talking now about 200 years okay. after Muhammad. Well, that's, sig um, that's significant. That, that's pretty significant. Um, so let's remember that when we consider, even when we talk about the Hadith. Now, for those of you who know what Hadith are, they are traditions of Muhammad's life, isolated traditions. Well, how do we stitch these Hadith together? Generally speaking, when Muslim scholars have stitched Hadith together in order to formulate a coherent view of Muhammad's time as a prophet, they're using the, the story from Ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ishaq gives us the backbone of Muhammad's life. So a lot of Muslims today want to throw out Ibn Ishaq because it's not Hadith, it's Sira. 
difference between the two is Sira is just a recording biography of Muhammad's life, whereas Hadith supposedly traces um, the lineage of authority from, from the person who ultimately wrote down whatever it was Muhammad said, who they heard it from, and then who that person heard it from, who that person heard it from, all the way back to Muhammad's time. So they say, I that's, got it from this guy, who got it from this guy, and that's called an Isnad chain, correct? Correct. So that kind of tradition is called Hadith. So many Muslims say, ah, we need these chains of authority in order to be able to trust these stories, so we can't use Sita. Even Muslims who say that still have to figure out what Muhammad's life looked like. They still have to come up with some kind of chronology. They do that from the Sita literature. Okay. So there's tafsir, which is commentary on the Quran. There's the Quran. hadith, which are sayings and deeds from Muhammad that have isnads connected to them. And then there's Sita literature, which is biographical material primarily. Yes. Sita means uh, a life of or biography of the, the, the path of. All right. So, I mean, there's a little bit to keep track of here. All right. So we still haven't answered the question, though, <laughs> where the early so, Muslims yeah, so, so you have all of these stories <laughs> coming from hundreds of years later, remembered through oral tradition. Now, I'm not sure if you saw the debate between Shabir Ali and David Wood um, on is the Quran a book of peace. Um, I would definitely suggest you watch that. It's on the queue. In, in the debate, Shabir Ali says that you can't really trust these oral traditions. And now we're talking about a Muslim scholar referring to hadith. And he says, look, it's like Chinese whispers, which in America we call the telephone game. It's, it's, it's like the telephone game where somebody hears something and they pass it on to somebody else. Over time, it gets changed. Um, while, while that doesn't work for the Gospels, I'd say, because the Gospels were written within the lifetime of the disciples, it certainly works for hadith and sirah because it's hundreds of years before they're written down. There is no control, no check over that oral tradition. And so when we have stories about what happened in Muhammad's life, it has come after hundreds of years of evolution of, of these kinds of uh, ideas. Okay. So then to answer the question about the early uh, Muslims, you're saying it's a bit tricky to discern that? You have well? to, I mean, any time we look at the life of Muhammad, what scholars are doing primarily is they're they're trying to find which which stories to trust and which stories to not trust. And so it really depends on which stories you listen to and which you don't. Now, if we use the stories that Muslim scholars say are reliable, by and large, okay. even Muslim scholars disagree with themselves, so you can't really say that uh, with any kind of confidence. But if we choose, by and large, those stories that Muslim scholars say is reliable, here's what we find out. Number one, during the time when Muhammad was being persecuted in Mecca, um, when he lived there, before he had an army, before any of that, um, he was actually telling people that he will bring them slaughter. Okay. okay that's found in the Hadith, that's found in the Sita. Uh, this is supposedly the time when Muhammad was just being peaceful, um, and he had no army. He says, I will bring you slaughter. Um, that's one thing we should keep in mind. Keep in mind, number two, um, in this time when Muhammad was uh, preaching a peaceful message, according to Islamic scholars, throughout that whole period of 13 years, he only gained a following of 100 followers. Um, that's it. Uh, so the peaceful Islam only managed to get 100 people to follow it. Um, at the end of the day, do I, do I think that Muhammad started off peacefully? Actually, I do. Um, I think that uh, to begin with, you can't start off being violent. I just think it's impossible. Um, so I, I do think there's a measure of truth in these accounts where early on there was peace. Um, but that doesn't mean that he wasn't plotting. And like I said, the Islamic records themselves, Muslim scholars themselves, record that Muhammad was plotting to ultimately take over Arabia. Okay, so... The message itself would have been peaceful and the actions would have been peaceful in the city at that time. But it seems like you believe that the larger goal and scope was not necessarily peaceful. And so was anyone actually being persecuted, though, on really either side? And if so, who and how do we know and why does that matter? <laughs> Again, the, we know by these records um, 
there were there are records of approximately 15 people being persecuted during this time. Uh, so 13 years, about one person a year getting persecuted with some kind of physical uh, ramification, that is. Um, and of them, I believe, I believe three people were killed. So three people uh, were killed. Would these be by uh, tribesmen uh, like of Muhammad's? own folks or or who who's doing this merchants these uh, would be the meccans uh richer meccans persecuting weaker poorer meccans who are following muhammad and um, some of them died like what's the circumstances of i mean do you know any of the info i'm just curious because i just hear they're persecuted but i don't know anything about details yeah it's been a long time since i've looked into these i i frankly don't trust these details anymore and so when, when I'm sharing with you, I'm sharing with you what the Islamic scholars have reconstructed. Um, and from what I recall, when I counted up the individual people who were persecuted during those first 13 years, 15 had some kind of physical persecution and three had died. Uh, I think they were slaves. Um, so their owners or masters were, were abusing their slaves who wouldn't listen to them. What about larger persecution? Like later on, it seems as if people would say, well, uh, you know, they were going to attack our town or they were going to raid our caravan. And so we had to fight back would be sometimes I hear a Muslim say something like that. What about later on when uh, Muhammad did have more power? OK, so Muhammad ultimately leaves Mecca 13 years after he starts his his prophecy or prophethood. The last few years of that was a boycott. The Meccans boycotted the Muslims during that time on account of, uh, of hardship through loss of food and stuff like that. Um, it's said that Muhammad's uncle died, uh, his, his wife died. Um, so, you know, you could count those numbers ultimately if you wanted to, but there was that period. When Muhammad finally goes to Yathrib, which was then called Medina al Nabi, also Medina, when he finally goes there, now Muhammad is in a place where he's not being persecuted. When he hears about Meccan trade caravans passing near where he is, he sends Muslims to go fight them, to go raid those caravans. Now, again, this is found in the Islamic sources. Um, so you, you look at uh, Sirat Rasulullah, for example, it has this. Uh, even Martin Lings, by the way, in his popular modern biography, records this. Muhammad would send raids on these caravans. Um, and the first time there was any bloodshed between Meccans and Muslims, now, now that Muhammad's left and he can live peacefully if he wants, the first time there was any bloodshed was during the holy month when there was a truth, a truce among all Arabs. All Arabs had agreed we will never fight one another during the holy month. But the first time there was bloodshed was during the holy month. And who did it? It was the Muslims who killed the Meccans during the holy month. I just feel like there's a lot of confusion with this topic because a lot of times people say, you don't understand, the Muslims were persecuted, so this is how they responded. But it doesn't seem like there's a lot of historical credence to that claim. Or have you ever heard folks say that? Am I the only one that hears oh, someone no, no, say no, no. that? Definitely. That's, that's the common response in the West. And so here, so I'm going to give two responses to that. Number one, the response from the angle of trusting the Muslim sources. Let's trust the Islamic sources what do we find out? Um, we find out that, okay, according to the Islamic sources, yes, Muslims were persecuted for the first 13 years. Um, but again, not that many Muslims and not that many people were killed. Um, there was 100 total and maybe three got killed, maybe more if you add in the boycott and its ramifications. When Muhammad goes to Medina, he now has the ability to live peacefully, yet he launches raids on Meccan caravans, again, according to the Islamic sources. It was in defense of one of their caravans that there was the first battle, the Battle of Badr. Um, it was fought to defend a caravan. Um, so from that point on, I mean, Muhammad never rested. From that point on, there was a battle every year um, from the time of, of that raid until Muhammad dies. Um, and, and a lot of that time, Muhammad does have control over Arabia. At, at one point, he gains control of Arabia. Why is he still fighting? Who does he say? Who does he have to fight at that point? Did anyone attack him? The answer is no. When you look at the chapter nine of the Quran, this is the last major surah, the last major chapter of the Quran to have been revealed according to Islam. This is by far the most violent chapter of the Quran. So you have a trajectory. Then, if the initial years were peaceful, by the time the last chapter arrives, it is the most violent chapter. And what does it say? If you look at 
chapter 9, verse 29 of the Quran. It says, fight the Jews and Christians, fight the people of the book, until they pay the jizya and feel themselves subdued. So, what is it saying? It's saying fight Jews and Christians. Okay, well, had any Christians ever attacked Muslims? Had any Christians ever been at war with Muslims? Never had any Christians attacked Muslims during the lifetime of Muhammad. And yet Muhammad's sending people to war against them? Why? The next verse tells us why. Because they believe Jesus is the Son of God, Allah's curse beyond them. Right, so it has to do with their creed. But I've heard other folks say, uh, something like this. It was a little confusing exactly what they were trying to tell me, but I've actually had more than one person say this. Um, those folks that it's speaking about were citizens of the Islamic kingdom at that point, sort of underneath the governmental rule, and they were committing treason that we, in some form. And so that is why. Have you ever heard something? someone say anything like that? Like this was uh, treasonous actions that were supposed to be uh, taken care of. Have you ever heard that response? I've heard different formulations of it. So I've heard that if you have an Islamic country, then, you know, you, you need to have, you need to submit to the rule. Uh, so you're allowed to live as Jews and Christians, but you have to submit by paying money. Um, okay, fine. Let's just say that that's okay to create second class citizens, which I don't think is okay. But let's just say we did. That's not the context here. If you go to the context of the Islamic stories, just uh, ribbon, read Ibn Kathir's um uh, oh gosh, um, Battles of the Prophet, Ghazwat um, al-Rasul. You, you read that book, Ibn Kathir gives you the full context of what's happening. Um, Muhammad is sending Muslim warriors to fight the Romans, Romans who had never fought Muslims. These weren't tra traitors within the Islamic empire. Um, now, if, if people want to say, no, 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 that wasn't the real context, well, what story are you using then? Uh, what evidence do you have of what the context is? And this is uh, what I find to be the primary problem with Islamic apologetics is it's a very cherry picking uh, enterprise. You, you kind of pick the sources you want to say uh, to, to defend your position. Um, if you just look at what the Islamic sources say, there is nothing peaceful about this verse. There's nothing even remotely resembling self-defense or law and order. It's go fight those Christians because – will get money, and because this is what they believe. And that is found in the context of the Islamic records. I've heard folks say in relationship to, I think it was the first caravan raid or one of the attacks, that it was just Muhammad and the Muslims trying to get their stuff back. Have you ever heard that? They're trying to get okay, their stuff so You're willing to kill people during the holy month to get stuff back? I mean, that's not cool. Uh, why <laughs> not be more diplomatic? Why not talk about things? Yeah, I've heard that before. Um, but, uh, the fact of the matter is Muhammad sent people to kill during the holy month of truce. They spilled first blood during a month of contractual peace. And by the way, this is why the Quran verse comes. There's a verse in the Quran, which says that oppression is worse than slaughter. Listen to that carefully. Oppression is worse than slaughter. In other words, yeah, yeah, they oppressed you so you can kill them. Uh, Wow, is that really what the Quran teaches? The answer is yes, that's what it teaches. It's not saying self-defense. Yeah, one of the sources you quoted, wasn't it from a, sort of a biography uh, of Muhammad that focuses just on the caravan raids? It's called like, is that one of the ones you're referring to? Uh, the Battles of the Prophet by Ibn Kathir, it's one of the most, uh, he's one of the most trusted commentators in the history of Islam. And he does talk about what these battles are. So it, I think it's a very telling um, uh, compendium. I heard, uh, is this, uh, racism, bigotry, true mixing? I don't know. See, I've been reading uh, about this. I was just reading a book called a history of Christian Muslim relations, Hugh Goddard. Uh, and he was quoting some other scholars and he said, uh, Muhammad was sort of continuing, uh, in a train or track of the way Arabian life was. And he quotes a guy who says that caravan raiding was the national sport of the Arabian Peninsula. That kind of statement, is that, you know, <laughs> what, what is that have any truth to it? For example, is just as something going on and it gets incorporated into Islam? You know, I'd have to see his reasons for saying that. And, you know, there's so much conjecture that happens here. I, I just always ask, whenever people give me an assertion, my first question is, 
Why do you think that? Right. Well, he, I know he didn't literally mean it was actually their actual national sport. <laughs> like, right. But, just but so. I mean, I have to wonder, you know, what records is he referring to to right, say right. that? Is he referring to records from hundreds of years later? I mean, what is he say, what is he using? Right. Um, and regardless, if you're talking about the best religion, which is what Muslims believe Islam is, um, gosh, uh, killing people during the holy month to get stuff back doesn't sound like it, it, it makes the cut. All right, four minutes to build the modern day relevance of this discussion because it's relevant. Explain. Yeah, well, I mean, you've got people asking questions about ISIS, right? Is is ISIS doing what uh, Muhammad taught, or are they not even Muslim? I've got some Muslims who honestly believe that ISIS falls outside of the fold of Islam because of what they're doing. Right. And I just got to tell them, look, they are quoting Muhammad and following him more literally than any other Muslim um, that I've seen. Uh, Usually you have other Muslims, like I said, sort of cherry picking between sources. I don't see them doing that. I see them accepting virtually everything you put in front of them, which is why they do what they do. Um, now, does that mean their, their Islam is automatically better than anyone else's? That's not my point. But if, but if, you're, if you're claiming to do what Muhammad did, um, they seem to be following the historical uh, records much better than anyone else. Um, so that is, I think very important. Uh, the Islam that people preach today, a peaceful Islam in the West, that is a reformed Islam. And, and in fact, I don't like using the word reform because we've used that word to mean going back to the roots. Uh, it's, it's a um, reimagined Islam, um, a progressive Islam. In order to be peaceful, you have to divorce Islam from the historical records of Muhammad. That's why this is important. All right. So the theological implications, let's say that um, someone is Muslim or interested in Islam, listens to this program. What do you want to say to them? You know, as you've kind of given a snapshot of some of the history, what do you want to say to them? They, okay, they're, they're sitting there. OK, so what does that mean? Does it is Nabil saying that I should become uh, more violent? Is Nabil saying I should leave Islam? Is Nabil saying I should be an updated modern twenty? What are you telling me by this? What What's it matter? I'm, I'm saying look at the prophet that you're going to say the shahada about. If you're going to say, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you're claiming that Muhammad is a prophet of God. You're making a positive assertion. So you, I think you really ought to know his life well before you say he's a prophet of God. And this is a part of his life at least the records that we have. Um, so if you're going to follow a man as your prophet, learn about him, see what he's said and done, uh, see what are in the records. Um, and if you, if you think Islam is a religion of peace and that's why you want to follow it, I guarantee you by any measure, Jesus was far more peaceful than Muhammad. And if you want to follow a peaceful man, you look for that in the Gospels. You find it in the person of Jesus. But if you're okay with the violent man, if, you, if you're okay with wars and, and that, and you can be, that's fine. If, if, you're, if you're okay with that, then you might want to follow Muhammad. But don't get the two confused. Do not get the two confused. Amen. That's a good way that's to good. close. Good finality. Reactions on today with Nabil. Well, I just would uh, echo uh, that, that last part. Uh, listening on podcasts, rewind and hear that last part, because I think that that actually helps me because I know we've done a bunch of these shows mm -hmm. and you're right. That's a question I think is worth asking. So are we, yeah, what are we saying to people right. <laughs> hearing this? And I think uh, in the end, because I know people would also might you know have critiques of Christianity in a lot of different ways and saying, well, you know, Christians have done violent things, et cetera, et cetera. But really at the heart, we're saying, you know, who should you follow, Muhammad or Jesus, <laughs> right? Um, mm -hmm. And I, I just love how you put that. I mean, look at their lives, look honestly at their lives and and you'll see two very different tracks. Um, and uh, I think that begins to hopefully, uh, as we hope here, to point people ultimately to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Nabil, we want to close with a little bit of a promotion. I don't think we got to promote your material enough, enough last time, but uh, this is true story. I has had a close friend for a while. And uh, when I first met, mixed up in drugs, all kind of crazy stuff, really got turned around. The Lord got a hold of her. She's like a new person and uh, uh, actually was, was my... Uh, not hairdresser, but she cut my hair. Okay. And one time, you know, you're talking and she's like, yeah, I'm reading this great book. It's so good. And, and you got to understand this is not her background. This is not really the type of thing I would expect to come out, come out of her mouth. She's like, yeah, it's called uh, seeking Allah, finding Jesus. I'm like, wait, what? And she starts telling me about it. I was like, look, yeah, I just got that book. I told her, I was like, but I haven't been able to read it yet. So she begins to tell me about it. And she 
totally understood everything in there. And this was definitely this. I knew this was the first kind of the uh, of this book she had written or read on this topic. And the way she was describing it was so clear and it clearly gave her a passion to love uh, Muslims that she had come in contact with in her neighborhood. And it was a great firsthand account. I was kind of almost reading it vicariously because I knew you, of course, before her, but she read the book and it was great to hear her say what she was saying. And so I think there's a real ministry that you're doing with the with the way you're writing and the things you're writing. So I want to encourage you in that. Thanks, brother. Yeah, I just want to make sure people know, look, we, we love Muslims. We love Muslim people. Uh, but that doesn't mean that what they believe is true. And that was my heart for this book, to, to, to understand and love your Muslim neighbor while getting to realize what Islam really is and, and the beauty of the gospel in light of that. And now you've got an audio narrated version of it that I think is rather new, if I'm not mistaken. I heard it's all in your voice. Tell us more about that. Yeah, um, actually, the um, the audio book I, I has been out for a while. What's okay. coming out now is the video study. Oh, so I've, okay. I've made some videos that go along with the book right. uh, so that you can watch me tell you how to understand some of these concepts in the book and how to reach out to your Muslim neighbors. All right. That's nice, man. And I got this final question. I, I think it was on Facebook. I don't remember where this was now, but I saw you with some pictures wearing like a cowboy hat or something. Is that something you <laughs> do on a regular basis? What happened? <laughs> Yeah, I lived in Texas, man, and Texas stole my heart, and now I'm in the UK, and I miss Texas. <laughs> so, w- would you ever dress like a Texan in the UK? In the UK? Uh, <laughs> probably not. That'd, that'd be probably a funny not. sight to see in a Bill Koresh. If you catch me in Atlanta, or if you catch me in uh, in Texas, you'll see me with my hat on and my boots. Speaking of that, you're going to be at ETS this year? I will. All right, hey, I'll be there this year, actually kicking it with David last year. We actually recorded some rap, like freestyle videos on the bookseller's floor. We're going to try to do it again this year. So if you're there, we could spit some freestyles about you. I'm trying to think of what will rhyme with Qureshi. <laughs> David used to rhyme it. Uh, Nabil Qureshi is the best. See? <laughs> see, <laughs> see, I knew it, man. Look at this. All right. Hey, man. Good. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I encourage you in your studies and the Lord bless you and your family as you continue on with this Nabil. Lord bless you guys too. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to minister. No doubt. Good stuff.